Okay, hello and welcome to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. And uh, I should say Ramadan Karim to those of you celebrating. We are truly pleased to be hosting this discussion today, looking at the energy transition in the Gulf and more globally uh, with this panel titled COPs, Oil Exporters and Their Role in the Energy Transition. Uh, we have an excellent panel of experts uh, with us today. I'll introduce them very briefly here and share a link to their full bios in the chat. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to welcome our good friend Kate Dorian, non-resident fellow at AGSI, a contributing editor at Mies, and a fellow at the Energy Institute. Previously, she was the regional manager for the Middle East and Gulf States at the World Energy Council, as well as, as, well as the program officer for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Energy Agency. Kate was recently named as one of the top 30 female energy analysts by Gulf Intelligence. Congratulations, Kate. Also, a warm welcome to our friend Jim Crane. He is the Wallace uh, Wilson Fellow for Energy Studies at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. He specializes in energy geopolitics uh, with a focus on oil exporting countries and the challenges they face from energy subsidies, internal demand, and climate change. He's the author of two books and his award-winning 2019 book, Energy Kingdoms, Oil and Pol Political Survival in the Persian Gulf is a Definitive Study of Energy Demand in the Region. Uh, I'm also happy to welcome back Aisha Sarihi. She is a non-resident fellow at AGSI, AGSI and a research fellow at the National University of Singapore's Middle East Institute. Her areas of research uh, interest include political economy of environmental sustainability, energy policy, renewables, climate policies with a focus on the Arab region. Uh, last but not least is Tobias Zumbregel. Tobias is a post postdoctoral researcher and lecturer at Heidelberg University. Previously, he worked at CARPO and at the University of Hamburg, where he is also an associate fellow. He's the author of Political Power and Environmental Sustainability in Gulf Monarchies, published in 2022. Moderating the session today is my colleague, colleague Eleanor Vandenbosch. She, she is a visiting scholar at AGSI, AGSIW. Her research currently focuses on green energy and democratization, the effect of climate change, and the energy, energy transition in the Gulf. She is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Uh, and with that, Eleanor, over to you. Yes. So welcome to all of you in the audience and, of course, to our four fantastic panelists. I'm so happy that all four of you agreed to participate in this panel, given your expertise on the topic. Uh, so today we will talk about CAP, oil exporters, and their role in energy um, transition. So a brief introduction. Um, we are all familiar with the debate that surrounded the UAE's UAE's presidency of COP28, more specifically about choosing ADNOC CEO um, to head the talks. Then the Azari presidency for COP29 was announced, and its president is also a former oil executive, um, the country's current ecology and natural resources minister, Mukhtar Babayev. Um, then uh, we will have Brazil for COP30 in 2025. Um, the current COP presidency announced recently the creation of a troika that includes the three presidencies so for COP28, COP29, and 30 to push for bigger commitments to cut emissions and to have more continuity from one COP to the next. The conundrum, of course, is that all three countries are planning to expand oil and gas production in the next five years and not marginally so. So some believe that oil producers need to be part of the solution for two main reasons. One is they have the funds to develop technological tools such as AI and CCS technologies um, that would help address the climate crisis. And it is also argued that bringing their business practices into the spotlight is the only way to hold them accountable. Um, other things that their presence at the negotiation table will derail the phasing out of fossil fuels and contribute to greenwashing. So I guess the first question to all four panelists is, um, um, as academics and Gulf specialists, what should we make of the increasingly influential role of oil exporting countries in shaping the world's response to the climate crisis in general, and more specifically their role in COP28, 29, and 30? Um, maybe um, Aisha, you wanna start? Sure. So first of all, uh, thanks very much, uh, Eleanor, uh, for uh, organizing this event. And it's a pleasure to be with esteemed panelists. 
Uh, I think uh, uh, to your question, uh, the first thing that we should uh, remember that, uh, you know, climate action uh, uh, represents a complex uh, trade-off for the oil producers. Uh, in one way, the energy sector, especially the fossil fuels, uh, contribute uh, significantly to the uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the fossil fuels have also played a significant role in shaping the economies of the uh, the oil producers. Um, and so they are in a situation where they need to uh, cut greenhouse gas emissions, but also to maintain the profits that come uh, from the uh, uh, fossil fuels. And basically, if we look around us, uh, uh, very immediately, we see everything depends on the fossil fuels, the electricity uh, for, for the Gulf country, the water also depends on the fossil fuels. Um, also, basic things, the furniture, the TV, so and so on, all of this depends on the fossil fuels. So to decouple our energy systems from the fossil fuels is not um, an easy task. Um, and perhaps this is why... Uh, we see uh, over the time, the oil producers have played a, a, a significant role, as you mentioned, Eleanor, in shaping the, um, the climate agenda and also the response to the climate action. Uh, to, uh, so historically, if we look at it, um, since the establishment of the UNF C in 1992, uh, we see the oil producers have uh, played a role to reflect on their concerns in the text of the UNFCCC. So in the text of the UNFCCC, we, we can find uh, you know, a clause that say that recognize the special difficulties of this country uh, uh, whose economy are particularly dependent on the fossil fuel uh, production, use and exportation. And this is also why, like later on, after the establishment of the UNFCCC, uh, the fossil fuel producers have played a you know kind of um, a role of removing any text of the fossil fuels in any climate treaties that came later on, uh, including, for example, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, as well as the COP communiques. Uh, only until recently, um, uh, uh, from COP26, uh, which was held in Glasgow in 2021, um, uh, we started to see an inclusion uh, of the text of the fossil fuel in the COP communique. And for the first time, we have seen uh, in the COP28, which was held uh, in an oil producing country, the UAE, uh, we have seen uh, the inclusion of transition away uh, from the fossil fuel for the first time. So in short, um, the, the oil industry uh, has a long engagement in shaping the climate response and the climate uh, negotiations as well. Uh, uh, it has been shifted from, uh, you know, a, a denial, a position of, uh, a denial, uh, and I would say to constructive engagement. Um, and the oil producers, um, uh, if we look, for example, at the COP28, um, uh, we see a, a large involvement of the uh, fossil fuel industry, um, uh, around more than 2,000 uh, 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 fossil fuel industry has been granted access to the COP28. And for the first time also, uh, we have seen, uh, I've been there, OPEC uh, had a pavilion for the first time. Uh, but uh, back to my point when I said uh, it is a constructive uh, engagement, now we see um, you know, the oil producers either uh, international oil companies or the national oil companies are taking um, an active role. Uh, at COP28, uh, there was an, an oil and gas decarbonization charter, uh, which uh, was signed by uh, 50 companies representing 40% of global oil production. Um, and um, 
the, the, the aim of the charter is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, to net zero by 2050 uh, and the methane, reducing the methane emissions uh, to near zero by 20, uh, uh, 2030. And today uh, we see more and more of oil companies around the world are setting net zero goals, including uh, those in the Gulf, uh, such as Aramco, Adnoc, uh, and BDO, all have set net zero goals. Uh, finally, uh, uh, if the question is whether um, I am with or against the engagement of the oil industry or this new trend of the oil industry uh, in achieving climate response, uh, my answer is certainly I am with because oil producers are not only dominating the, uh, the uh, production of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but they also have the financial and the technical capacity to address climate challenges. They have uh, the skills uh, which can be easily transferred to adopt the solutions to uh, the climate change. Um, last but not least, uh, uh, the last point I also want to highlight on is it's not actually about oil producers only. It's also about the major consumers of the fossil fuels as well, uh, be it China, for example, Japan, and Korea. So it, in a way, it, we, we are dealing with a complex system, uh, and everyone is facing a, a complex trade off that we need to address. Yes, very much so. Thank you. Um, uh, Tobias, you want to go to second? Yeah, sure. Um, let me also thank you um, for having me. It's really a pleasure. And thanks for organizing this, this panel. Um, well, I mean, I can definitely agree with a lot of uh, what Aisha has said. Um, so we have, well, new emerging actors here. It's not nothing new. Um, they have been around for some time, but certainly we can see that there is kind of a paradigm shift of being climate deniers towards a more proactive and constructive engagement with climate diplomacy. Um, but um, then again, I mean, we, we also have to acknowledge that they have actually a very powerful impact on those climate uh, negotiations. And we have to understand the particular interests and the conditions of those very different actors. And I mean, we are not speaking here of a homogeneous block of oil producing countries. Each country has their own particular interests and conditions. And uh, so we have to be also a little bit uh, careful in, in really zooming in and to trying to find out the different motives and agendas of certain countries. But if you would ask me also um, whether I see an overall trend here um, and a development, then I would say that we can see actually with this engagement of this new or not so new, but very powerful actors, um, that we can see something that has also been established since Kyoto and uh, the clean development mechanism, that we can see this kind of neoliberalization neo of nature here. So we are talking much more about a commodification of uh, or using selling carbon as a commodity. Uh, we are talking much more about carbon emissions. We are talking about um, new technologies for carbon sequestration. So actually it is shifting a little bit and the topics are shifting with those actors. And this is something um, we, we should see. This is not something that is only, as Aisha has also mentioned, not purely exclusive for those oil producing countries because it definitely appeal also to Western countries um, and to consuming countries to have this kind of neoliberal turn in the climate negotiations, but they certainly boosting and fostering this kind of, of discussion. Why we have to be careful that maybe we are not losing or marginalizing other topics that are also very important in the climate negotiations, such as just transition, climate justice, uh, taking into consideration the other countries, vulnerable countries, vulnerable groups. Um, so this is something uh, we should also pay attention to. Jim, would you like to answer? Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, thanks again for for you know me from me too uh, <laughs> from uh, 
here in uh, sunny Houston, where um, you know we also have a, a pretty big, uh, robust uh, oil and gas industry and energy industry in general. You know, it's a pretty similar case with us here. I mean, we, you know, oil companies in general have a massive stake, of course, in climate, uh, climate action, and in the energy transition. Uh, and as Aisha said, you know, these guys have, uh, you know, big pools of investment capital and lots of relevant skills. And, you know, when they are uh, ready to take it seriously, uh, we they would make fantastic partners. I mean, you know, whether it's in, you know, geothermal, uh, where there's a lot of interest here in Texas now on the same well pads that are uh, being used to produce oil and gas, uh, uh, you know, you can produce ge geothermal power, uh, you know, big offshore wind projects, clean fuels, you know, carbon capture and sequestration. Um, you know, we're seeing here in Houston, uh, you know, here at, you know, at Rice University, where I teach, uh, you know, a lot of employees now from oil companies are coming back to get a, uh, to get an education, to make a switch uh, from, uh, from, from the oil uh, and gas business into other uh, parts of the energy sector. Um, and we're seeing new companies popping up and new opportunities. You know, the big IOCs are not as much uh, uh, on board with this yet. I mean, they are starting to spend some uh, some of their capital on new energies, but um, not a big portion yet. Um, I see the main barrier for this is really the loss of profits, right? The rates of return for uh, for non-oil businesses are just nowhere near what they are in the oil sector. Uh, and this is, you know, for the Gulf uh, and other oil, big oil exporting countries, uh, you know, especially places, you know, where the reserves are owned by the public, you know, unlike the U.S., right? It's the landowners here that own the oil. Um, you know, the uh, you know those countries um, have you know have a sort of a visceral need for um, uh, for the for the oil rents that fund uh, the government budgets and uh, social welfare, et cetera. Uh, and you know, can you run an oil monarchy without oil rents? Um, you know, I mean, Dubai has managed to uh, you know, so they've converted from you know. I, Describe them as sort of the first successful post-oil economy in the Middle East, um, but they still benefit from indirect uh, access to, to to oil rents. And you know the Dubai model is probably pretty uncomfortable uh, for lots of other countries that maybe don't want to invite in so many uh, expatriates to to the point where they dominate the population. So. Um, you know, the renewables businesses and the other businesses that you know Dubai and others are are choosing to. Uh, uh, to replace uh, uh, oil are just not as profitable uh, as oil. And, you know, we're seeing some of this in the, in the stats, right? So renewables installations uh, as a percentage of power, I think the Middle East is the second lowest region for, um, for this in the world. So it's really uh, lagging way behind uh, uh, the rest of the world. You know, countries in the Middle East have been talking about this for a long time. Um, only one that, that I've seen so far has reached has declared goals and reached them, and that's the UAE. Um, uh, you know, they they've made some uh, some big big statements about their goals, and and um, some of them actually they've 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 reached in full on time. Uh, uh, so um, kudos to them. But but nobody else that that I've found yet in my examination uh, has managed to hit hit their goals. Uh, you know and. Renewables, you know, obviously we don't have to say this uh, over and over, but they make a lot of sense in that part of the world. Um, countries also want to use them to to back out oil and gas from their domestic economy, uh, to use that for exports, you know, to to improve their exports. Uh, you know, and if they have a, a, a net zero goal, that also uh, looks good for, you know, good, uh, on their on their emissions account. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, as Tobias said, we've had oil companies for a long time and governments basically blocking, stonewalling, delaying uh, climate action, which has been unfortunate uh, because, you know, they, a lot of valuable time was lost. They could have been, uh, you know, spending that on R&D into their favorite, uh, you know, solutions, you know, whether that's clean fuels like hydrogen and, and ammonia or, or carbon capture or whatever. Um, and But these solutions, you know, that they prefer um, now look less competitive uh, com you know you know the, the, the renewables electrification path has kind of proven itself and gotten cheaper and cheaper so um, I think the um, you know oil uh, you know petro states are kind of a little bit um, under pressure now to uh, uh, to try and move a little more quickly with the and, and try to shape things in in a direction that they prefer so leave it there 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, Kate, the last one. <laughs> yeah, always last. Um, I suppose it's my age. Um, I've seen it all happen. I was just looking at some numbers and both of us were at um, COP, I'm sure a lot of you were as well. And let's not forget that one of the sticking points was the language over fossil fuels. So we've been you know, going at this for a long time, redacting and redacting the, the language. And if you and of course Saudi Arabia was one of the um, one of the countries that objected to the wording needed it changed. And if you listen to the Minister of Energy, Prince Abdulaziz, afterwards, he basically is looking at the the, the text, the, the the agreement as you know we can pick and choose. You know we can cherry pick. We can do this. We can do that. But we're going to continue to produce oil. And if you haven't seen it, I don't know, Jim, if you were in Houston at Zero Week, but the speech that was made by the CEO of Saudi Aramco. Um, was actually quite enlightening. Um, I have to agree with him on certain certain aspects of what he said. He said, you know, uh, we've seen the share of fossil fuels of oil and gas in the energy complex over two decades. It's barely budged from 83 to 80%. Renewables, despite having invested 9.5 trillion in renewables over that period in solar and wind, it still makes up 4%. So, you know, under the COP28 agreement, we're supposed to go treble um, investment or treble capacity, renewable energy capacity. And that's not to say that, the as, as we've all mentioned, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Oman, led by the UAE, they've actually made quite a big advance in, in deployment of, of wind and solar. It's mainly solar that's pushed the growth. But if you look at the numbers, and I was looking at the IRENA numbers, between 2014 and 2023, We've seen enormous growth in um, in renewables capacity. I mean, Saudi Arabia was at 24 megawatts in 2014. There, 2023, they were at 2,689 uh, megawatts. UAE went, went from 133 megawatts to 6052. And the biggest changes came in between 2022 and 2023. We've seen huge change in the capacity, for example, um, in, in the UAE, it nearly doubled between 2022 and 2023. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, it's gone up by, by nearly 200%. But I think it's difficult to say that you can exclude the oil and gas companies because they do represent such a huge portion of the energy structure. And, you know, we've said it before, it's not it's no secret that they've got the funding, they've got the technology. Um, and, you know, Aranto might talk about not expanding its production capacity. I don't think, you know, they, they've scrapped this decision. I think you want me to talk about this later on, so I won't dwell on it. But um, they do have, they are allocating funds for clean energy. So, for example, in, uh, in Aramco's case, for the next two years, um, new energies are going to be 10% of their total, um, total spend which is about uh, somewhere around 50 billion. Uh, and then it's going to go up over, you know, in the years after that. So, you know, things are being done, but I think as, as, as everybody mentioned, there's a lot of talk. Uh, we've talked about carbon capture. We've talked about, but, you know, all these technologies have not really been developed at scale. Saudi Arabia is investing hugely in its gas, uh, both conventional and unconventional, that will produce more liquid, so they don't really need that capacity. It's not really climate related, it's just the fact that, you know, if you are sitting at the moment on 3 million barrels a day of capacity, you don't really need to invest more because you can free up by switching from oil and liquids and power generation to gas, um, renewables. Uh, and I think, as everybody's mentioned, the UAE is a good example of how investing in nuclear power, for example, has actually reduced demand for gas. Um, but that's not to say, you know, and, and we've, everybody talks about, oh, you know, demand is going to peak sometime, you know, all fossil fuels are going to peak by 2030, if you look at the IEA's 2050 net zero a pathway. But I think there's still a lot of scope for gas um, for natural gas to um, to grow because it is the base load. It is still the base load in in, in this part of the world. But um, I think it's it would be unfair to say that there hasn't been progress. But I found that since COP twenty eight, the oil producers, or at least Saudi Arabia, OPEC, have become a bit more def defensive. 
Um, the OPEC Secretary General wrote this article, posted on the website uh, early in, in early March, basically saying, if oil were to disappear tomorrow, you know, the world would come to a, to, to a to complete halt. Um, so I think there is a sort of, it, it, there is a bit of reluctance to sort of go headlong and say, okay, we support the transition. Um, but, you know, it, 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 I think it would be fair to say that things are being done. Uh, there is more efficiency being built into the system. So it's, um, it's not all black and white. It's sort of somewhere gray in between. I guess I have a follow-up question for you, um, Kate. So your work focuses on oil and gas markets and energy transition, right? And you recently wrote a piece on long-term oil demand outlook. Um, so following Aramco's decision to halt output expansion be because, as they stated, because of the energy transition, I was wondering if you could discuss how fast we should really expect the world's energy transition to take place and do you see a link between that time frame, potentially shorter time frame that what we expected earlier, like even five to ten years ago, and the leadership role that the UAE particularly um, is taking in climate in climate talks? Um, I mean, one of the one of the reasons why the UAE succeeds, and 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 I think a lot of the Gulf states, you know, when they set targets, and it's a very top heavy. You know, it's a top-down kind of government system where the government makes the decisions. There is no questions asked. You know, it gets done. Um, you know, the UAE runs, it's a very efficiently run country. So things do function. Uh, targets are met sometimes even ahead of time. So that's why, you know, you actually see the progress is sort of quite evident. But um, it's, in, in the case of Saudi Arabia, I think there is, you know, when you're talking about a country that has had to sort of reduce its production to less than 9 million barrels a day in order to prop up the market, it is still very much driven, the economy is still very much driven by oil and, and, and oil export revenues, you know, which, whichever way you would. Even when you see, you know, Aramco shares being transferred to, to, to the PIF, to the Public Investment Fund, it's basically taking from one wallet and putting it in another, really. It doesn't really generate much economic activity. So I think they are in a bit of a dilemma. I, I've heard you speak about this in the uh, TIA Foundation um, webinar by podcast, basically, that they need to generate the rents because all these grandiose projects Projects that you know neon and so on aren't really going to filter down to sort of your your average Saudi. It's a very youthful population. You need to create new jobs. So I think uh, you need to generate the the, the 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 revenues from your oil exports in order to drive the transition, in order to drive your vision twenty thirty. So uh, it's it and it's a very very uncertain market at the moment. I mean, it, it's there is geopolitical risk at the moment which uh, is, I think, um, diverting attention away from other issues. You've got elections coming up in the United States. I mean, that might really change the the, the picture in, in, in the United States. I mean, if you don't have the United States in the climate sort of grouping, if they're not, if you get a, a if you get a Republican win, for example, if you get Trump back in the White House, I mean, what happens to the climate agenda then? We know he's not very keen on the Paris Agreement. We know he's not very keen. But uh, you've got elections in, in various countries. I mean, in Europe, you're seeing a lot of shifts in the sort of in in politics, which could not be very friendly to the climate agenda. So I think that's something that we all have to think about. So there's a lot of uncertainty built in at the moment, which, but in terms of reaching targets, I think there are certain countries like Oman, which really need to go ahead with their green hydrogen projects because they're not huge producers of energy. They're not as wealthy as the other countries. Um, but again, you know, we talk about green hydrogen. Well, you need off takers, you need a market. You talk about carbon capture, you talk about, the, you need to, have a carbon price, you need to activate uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which really deals with it so that you can generate the funding and pour it into renewables. So I think there's a lot of loose ends, which maybe in Azerbaijan, some of it will, will be resolved. Um, thank you. Um, Tobias, I had a, a question for you. Um, given your research um, focuses a great deal on power structures and domestic political legitimacy, 
Um, I wanted to ask you to discuss the link you might see between Gulf countries' participation in climate talks on the one hand and domestic politics on the other hand. Um, so what do you think would the domestic goal um, be in trying to take the lead um, in uh, in this COP Troika, for example? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, well, I mean, I would make two points here at first. That is that, um, so there are economic goals, as we have already explained, and they are also aligned with the political interests here. So it is actually, I mean, and this is why we're talking about political economy approaches. So it's actually very merged here, these kind of two interests. And the other point is that it's not only about the domestic arena, it's like uh, that there's uh, the international interest and the international behavior is also aligning with a certain interest on the domestic dimension. So it's actually a two level game here where they are trying to to have a stake on the international agenda, but then also have repercussions, positive repercussions on the domestic front. Um, let me um, try to, to illustrate this a little bit. I mean, so economically, um, we have we have already talked about this point that we are all aware about the fact of economic diversification. We are trying to limiting the dependence of oil. Of course, I mean, this does not mean that we are getting rid of fossil fuels, but there are certainly a lot of efforts. And this is also why I, why I would not say it's a greenwash here. It's certainly something, it's substantial um, and it's profound here, this kind of economic transformation. But it's a hybrid approach using new technologies, new energy, green hydrogen, renewable energy sources, and also trying to, to sell oil and gas as long as it's lucrative. Um, and let's just, one example here, I mean, um, looking to the national, the, the NDCs submitted by Saudi Arabia or the updated. So there are actually two future scenarios for the kingdom. The one is, the first is that they are betting or expecting more revenues from oil and gas in order to boost their domestic um, economy by having all these revenues from, the, from exporting oil and gas. Um, and the other point is, and, and this kind of revenues will then be, be invested into what they call high value added sectors, such as financial services, tourism, and so forth. Um, the other scenario is actually that they are not selling oil and gas so much, but using this kind of hydrocarbons for a domestic industrialization. So this is actually another approach, but in two scenarios, oil and gas will be relevant. And this is um, this has, of course, certain implications for the domestic arena as well. So um, this is one of the economic arguments. But of course, I mean, it's also politically because the political stability of those countries and the, the political fabric here and the social socioeconomic fabric of those countries is based on oil and gas. And of course, I mean, they want to preserve this kind of status of wealth and political stability they have gained throughout the last century but they are confronted with new realities here. And this is why they have to adapt here. So, um, and, and this is why we, we are seeing actually different approaches here. Jim is certainly right when seeing that, well, renewable energy sources will not bring the revenues we have seen by oil and gas, but there's more to this than only the numbers. It's, uh, they are trying to present themselves also as reliable energy suppliers, which they have been for a long time. So. This could also be happen with hydrogen and there will be offtake markets. And this is why they are aggressively also trying to have a lot of MOUs and agreements with other partners, especially in Germany or in, in Europe, but especially in my uh, home country in Germany. So a lot of those agreements have already been, been, been made. Um, and this is why we, we are seeing that based on this kind of economic rationale, they are proactively, politically using or trying to, to influencing the climate diplomacy in their favor, saying that it's not about abandoning or phasing out fossil fuels, but trying to have different approaches here, maybe a less or a less strict and a more vague um, terminology here in terms of transitioning away. This means, well, we can use, uh, we, can, we can still rely on fossil fuels, we can, um, use carbon technology sequestration. So we actually can do business as usual, but we can make it climate neutral by focusing on controlling the emissions, but not really 
the business of selling oil and gas. So this is very important. And this is why we have seen this kind of more assertive approach of these countries um, in the COPs. Then another point is that it's not only about um, the political, economic, rational when it comes to sustainability. I think we, sh we should also um, not forget that COPs have actually um, been emerged and developed into global platforms that are not only for governments, but a lot of different and a wider public and many other non-governmental actors out there. So it's actually also, it has become a very important tool for public diplomacy here. So these conferences evolved into a strategic asset in terms of uh, away from, from the traditional negotiations, but into meetings of global events, influencing international climate policies, of course, but also uh, shaping new ideas, uh, creating business opportunities, um, influencing various actors beyond only this kind of climate change topic. So, um, and I think that the latest COP has been a perfect example why this is also a very interested, why climate diplomacy and hosting COPs is also has become a very important field for the Gulf states. And this mm -hmm. is not only on external level, it definitely reflects on the domestic level as well, because in the end, the Gulf states are having kind of an all-in-one solution here. They are presenting themselves internationally as important actors in the fight against climate change. But at the same time, they can also reinforce their crucial role as reliable energy supplier in future, while they can also legitimizing themselves in front of their public um, popular in their, their domestic population by by advancing this kind of green development without really having to sacrifice the prosperity and the welfare that has been based on hydrocarbons. So it's actually kind of a very smart move here that has international leverage and can increase international leverage while also boosting the domestic legitimacy in front of the population. And um, yeah, in this regard, I, I think that um, it's difficult to see the, so the different dimensions are really closely entangled here and uh, they are trying to play all sides. And I think that they are doing this in a very smart and, and very uh, creative way that um, brings a lot of ben benefits so far. Thank you. It's uh, funny you mentioned that because I was, um, you know, when I was at COP, uh, sitting under a tree, um, someone was sitting next to me and he just said, do you know that this is the first for-profit cop? Yeah. And I was like, ah, that's a very interesting way of, of putting it. And it very much felt that way. Um, Aisha, um, I have a question on diversification because that's your, um, that's your expertise. So I was wondering if you could speak to um, how diversification in non-oil sectors um, looks like in other oil exporting countries like Azerbaijan, for example. And then are Gulf countries also getting involved? We know they're getting involved in a lot of different countries in Africa, etc. Are they also getting involved in helping diversify those um, economies um, or developing the green energy sector? So, yeah, thanks very much for uh, a very good question on the economic diversification. In fact, economic diversification is also part of the discussion in the climate negotiations, uh, because, uh, as I mentioned in the UNFCCC text, there is a mention of the impact of the response measures, uh, and that includes the oil producing countries. Now, uh, also one of the agenda when we attend the COP uh, is the uh, how countries can uh, address the impacts of response measures. And economic diversification is one of the solutions. And in fact, I have been working on a report where I looked at more than 10 countries on how they do the economic diversification. Hopefully the report will, be, will come out uh, in June uh, this year. Um, and so on Azerbaijan, which is going to host like COP29 uh, this year, all the eyes are on Azerbaijan, um, same as when the UAE was hosting the COP. Uh, maybe we didn't know much about it, but now we like we dig and we try to understand uh, the situation in Azerbaijan. 
uh, in fact, Azerbaijan and the Gulf, uh, in a way, have common uh, economic interest. Uh, and uh, they both uh, depend on the oil and gas uh, for the economic development, uh, but they also aspire to diversify their economies. But because the Gulf countries have started early on for Azerbaijan, the Gulf countries set a, a role model for Azerbaijan, like to uh, you know uh, figure out how they can do their economic diversification. Uh, and for for the Gulf countries, uh, most recently, yes, we have seen economic diversification is the focus. Uh, uh, most recently, but because uh, of these uh, ongoing uncertainties around oil prices, the oil revenues, uh, and as well as amid uh, you know ongoing uh, multi-polar world, we see the Gulf countries are not only focusing domestically when it comes to economic diversification, but they also try to uh, you know, do the same from a foreign policy perspective. Uh, they uh, most recently, like last year, we have seen the Gulf countries had uh, hosted a, a summit with Central Asia and another summit with Southeast Asia. Uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia joined the BRICS uh, last year. And I think the idea is to uh, uh, increase the multi-alignment and enhance the win-win uh, uh, in terms of the economic cooperation. Um, so when it comes to Azerbaijan, uh, I think uh, it's the same uh, idea, especially Azerbaijan is interlocated between Asia uh, and Europe. Um, and in a way, Azerbaijan face kind of similar uh, of uh, geopolitical uh, challenges as uh, with the Gulf, because it is surrounded by Iran, uh, Turkey, and Russia. So uh, uh, in a way, uh, it, it faced some uh, similar uh, threat perceptions, especially when it comes to Iran and Islamic uh, groups. And so this kind of like makes the two, the Gulf and Azerbaijan, um, you know, in kind of in the same uh, position. So, uh, and if we look at the, uh, you know, you ask whether the Gulf countries help, uh, as I mentioned, the, the approach of the Gulf countries is to, uh, enhance uh, their partnership uh, and cooperation as much as possible and enhance this win-win uh, economic cooperation. So um, we, in Azerbaijan, there is uh, indeed, the Gulf countries are top investors uh, in there, especially the UAE and Saudi Arabia. They do invest in the energy sector um, they uh, they do um, uh, invest in the tourism sector, uh, so um, uh, uh, majority of you know uh, Azerbaijan is a, a major tourism destination for uh, tourists from the Gulf, um, and also clean energy uh, is uh, is another sector where the Gulf has uh, been involved uh, in investing in. Um, Aqua Bauer of Saudi Arabia have invested in a wind uh, plant in Azerbaijan. Uh, Masdar of the UAE uh, has contributed uh, in a, a solar power plant uh, uh, in there. Uh, but I would say, um, uh, you know, uh, this kind of the co-investment is asymmetrical. Uh, there's more of an engagement of the Gulf in Azerbaijan, but not uh, uh, vice versa. Um, uh, more briefly on the economic diversification, because I spent a long time putting the report together. Um, uh, in fact, when I looked at the Gulf, I think the Gulf countries have made a, a good progress in the economic diversification. Uh, I looked at examples like Indonesia, Mauritius uh, um, uh, and others, what these countries have done, which are commodity dependent economies, what they have done, they have uh, focused on increasing the value of the commodity that they have. Uh, for instance, uh, 
um, chili, which depends on the sugar as a commodity, uh, as agricultural commodity, and just producing sugar and then export it. What they have done, they actually uh, try to put kind of obligation on the uh, the investors to uh, first of all to produce quality sugar, and then also to produce other products from the sugar and then export it. So they enhance the value of it. Um, uh, Indonesia, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, also did the same, but with uh, with the minerals. So they used to produce uh, the to extract minerals like copper and then export it. But then they also put an obligation for other invest for the investors to um, you know process it domestically and then export it. Um, and generally speaking, there are two uh, approaches uh, for the economic diversification. One is vertical, and the other one is horizontal. The uh, horizontal is when we make uh, the uh, the value of the existing communities as much as possible. Uh, but the the vertical is when we try to develop new sectors. The Gulf countries have managed successfully to do the horizontal economic diversification, which is uh, uh, you know to develop the petrochemicals. Uh, uh, the aluminum and other uh, products that comes from the uh, the use of the oil and gas. Um, uh, and now they are also trying uh, to do the vertical diversification, which is the development of other non-oil sectors, uh, including a focus on the tourism, for example, uh, logistics, um, uh, and enhancing the role of the private sector. Um, uh, I would say there is... There is a progress, uh, but you know much more uh, can be done, and uh, the Gulf countries are really concerned about this uh, and trying to work on it. So yeah, I'll stop there. But I guess uh, diversification was mentioned um, in 1968 in the first five-year development plan, uh, the first Saudi five-year development plan uh, or second, and now we saw. We also the news last week that Saudi Arabia's non-oil sector reached fifty percent of GDP for the first time ever. So, um, so some progress is being made. Um, Jim, uh, so we know that post World War II, um, oil played a major role in shaping the world order, right? Which has, um, been the same kind of until now. Could you speak to the way that the energy transition is modifying international relations um, and reshaping geopolitics? Um, is that something that we should observe or pay particular attention to in climate negotiations? And then I will have a um, follow-up question asked uh, by one of the uh, people in the audience, um, which is also about international order or security. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Eleanor. I, I did see the question from Nasser al Dajani yes. here. So I'll uh, try yes. and uh, touch on some of that uh, uh, in my response here. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, you, you know, of course, I mean, you know, the energy transition, it, it really is uh, uh, starting to modify, I'd say. So it's, it's creeping in for sure into, uh, to, into international relations and, and geopolitics. And for you know exporting states in a kind of a bad way, um, you know uh, there's some big downsides for them economically, diplomatically, and strategically. Uh, you know, it's, it, you know, oil had a monopoly on the transportation sector as a transportation fuel since the 1920s, really 20, you know, maybe late 1920s, um, and that is starting to be challenged. Right. So, um, you know, it's a, so, you know, transportation services are super value valuable and, you know, that makes them uh, strategic and oil is a strategic commodity. It's so important for the global economy and for for, for militaries, and national defense, everything. So um, as that monopoly uh, begins to weaken, you know, this, the you know, oil states are probably going to lose some of their strategic value to, uh, you know, to the world and, and lose maybe some of their influence uh, alongside uh, income, um, you know, as, as substitutes gain ground. So one way to kind of think about 
how this could play out. So one small example, right? If uh, you think about um, U.S. Saudi relations, and you know, referring to the the question, uh, uh, you know, in the in the in the queue here, um, you know, U.S. defense, uh, you know, hard security protection for um, you know for its uh, our friends in in the Gulf. Um, what happens when lots of American motorists start driving electric vehicles? Okay, so um, you know one of the key things about politics in the United States is that presidential popularity is negatively correlated, right, with the with gasoline prices here in the U.S. Uh, and one of the ways that the U.S. president gets uh, uh, you know gasoline uh, prices down, especially election times, with the help of Saudi Arabia. So. You know, Saudi, you know, the U.S. president, and we've seen this in the Biden administration, treats Saudi Arabia really deferentially, especially at le election time. Um, but as, uh, you know, U.S. voters start driving more and more, oh, there goes my light, sorry, uh, more and more electric vehicles, um, they're going to be less exposed to the gasoline price. And that might free up, you know, in a couple of presidents down the road, probably not immediately, that might give the U.S. president a bit more uh, freedom of action in in uh, in relations with Saudi Arabia, um, if that negative correlation between gasoline prices and popularity of the president weakens, right? So, you know, U.S. president may no longer want to act so deferentially uh, to, to, to Saudi Arabia, and the relations could be damaged, um, you know, if, if something came up, right? So, um, you know, there are other things besides oil that, that uh, you know, that the U.S. is, uh, you know, partners with Saudi Arabia about. But um, but it is a, a an important factor uh, in that relationship. Um, and then, you know, oil demand, um, you know, this notion that we're going to hit an oil demand plateau sometime soon and then we're going to have a decline in, in, in oil demand. Well, we've never seen this before. And, nobody, you know, it's a lot of uncertainty around what happens when oil demand starts to come down. Um, and depending on how OPEC plays this, uh, you know, it could get tough for petro states, right? So, I mean, if OPEC hangs together, especially OPEC plus, uh, and manages a market in decline and keeps oil prices relatively high and, you know, manages to keep this quota system intact, maybe even enhance it uh, in ways that, uh, you know, allow low carbon oil, uh, you know, give preferences to lower carbon oil or somehow enhance decarbonization of oil. Um, uh, you know, it, it might be a softer landing for, for export states. But if OPEC disintegrates and we see more competition around lifting costs, you know, among oil producers that, you know, or want to bring oil to market sooner rather than later, um, you know, we're already starting to see a little bit of these pressures, right? The UAE is, you know, is, is, is among those uh, wanting to monetize its reserves sooner rather than later, uh, seemingly. Um, but, um, you know, so we could see a lower price uh, a scenario too, um, especially when, when demand starts to decline. You know, and then the other side of this is what happens, you know, in the, you know, the, the transition type of, of um, uh, energy sources, you know, that, that rely a lot on, materials and minerals and mined, um, you know, mined, mined substances. Um, those, you know, from all the stuff I read and the stuff I've done, you know, it seems that they're never going to provide anywhere near the types of rents, uh, revenues, or geopolitical power uh, that oil has given states, right? They just don't lack that same, you can't use them in the same way. You know, an embargo on, on minerals, you know, we've seen this before. It doesn't work the same way that that in, and an embargo on fuels, you know, combustible fuels that you need. You need that supply chain connected 24-7, 365, right? It always has to be connected. If you interrupt that supply chain, uh, you know, bad things can happen. People can die, right? You know, as we've seen uh, when, you know, natural gas for heating or power generation was cut. Um, so, um, you know, cutting off the of minerals uh, doesn't, doesn't act in the same way. You know, I mean, I, I, so I often ask my students, you know, what happens if the Strait of Hormuz gets blocked and you drive a gasoline powered, you know, sport utility vehicle? Are you going to be affected by that? And they say, yeah, of course. You know, we, you know, probably my next time I fill up my my, my tank, I'll, I'll be affected. And I said, what if you what if Dometic, uh, you know, DRC, uh, you know, stops exporting uh, co uh, uh, cobalt for some reason and you drive a Tesla? Are you going to be affected by that? 
And they say, well, no, because my, my, my Tesla's already got the cobalt in the battery uh, and I don't, uh, so that doesn't affect me. You know, if, if, you, if I was shopping for a Tesla and hadn't bought one yet, or if I had Tesla shares, that might affect me. So the, you know, energy security, um, uh, you know, constructs are going to change pretty dramatically. Uh, and I don't see the same amount of nuisance power, um, uh, you know, from, from exporting countries of minerals that oil uh, and gas exporters have. You know, we've seen Russia, you know, it's a great example of this right now. Um, you know, the tr size of the trade, too, is probably going to drop. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, fuel exports, oil, gas, and coal are a huge percentage of global trade. Um, and, you know, mineral commodities are just not... It's not going to be as big, even with the, with the growth and the and and the, and the you know the income also. So you know stuff I've read suggests that we're not you know very few countries are going to see more than five percent of their GDP coming from mineral rents, right? And it's, so it's just you know it's not going to it's not going to be it's not it just doesn't it's not going to be as big of a business or have the same kind of attractions or geopolitical risk. So. Um, so for most of us, this is really good news. You know, I think um, you know it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a way to 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 get more energy security and you know reserve your your fuel based systems as backup. Um, but uh, you know, if you're a petro state, it's not so. Uh, that's not happy news. Not happy news. Um, so Nasser Al um, Al Dajani um, wrote this question that you touched upon, but I want to read it out loud. What is the impact of the green transition on security and defense of the block of the Gulf bloc? And is there a correlation between this and the prospect of Gulf monarchies seeking normalization with Israel? Um, so I was wondering if any of you wanted to um, answer that uh, specific question. Well, I, I haven't thought about the Israel side of it, but, I, you know, I so I guess I, I gave a long winded way of saying that you know, U.S. hard security protection um, uh, could be weakened. Uh, you know, the impetus for that could be weakened by the energy transition. I can't, I, I, nothing leap into mind on how it would have, but I'm sure somebody else uh, can can answer the second part. I can talk about the linkage between what is going on and the sort of the transition um you know, the, the, the region is in turmoil. I don't think anybody knows how it's going to play out. I think the um the the Saudi Arabia rapprochement you know, establishing diplomatic relations with Israel is not going to happen immediately because now they've tied it to the whole Palestinian issue. That's you know, it's 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 getting complicated and more it was always complicated, it's getting more complicated. So I think None of the countries in the region are going to want to rock the boat. I mean, let's wait and see what happens in Egypt. They've just increased the prices of fuel, um, you know, because they need cash. I mean, Egypt is really, really being affected by the Red Sea attacks uh, on shipping. Uh, Suez Canal revenues are way down. We're seeing, you know, and, and the Houthis don't look like they're going to um, stop anytime soon. Uh, they're even threatening Saudi oil installations. So I think there's just so much turmoil at the moment that it's very difficult for governments to say, OK, we're going to speed up the transition. We're going to speed up moving away from oil and gas, because at the end of the day, you do have, you know, transitions are messy in, by, by their very nature. So uh, and if you listen to, I mean, Nasser, CEO of Aramco, he doesn't talk about renewables or he talks about alternative energies, i.e. you can alternate between various energies. But there is a certain advantage as well, you know, when we talk about the, the transition, the Gulf states, the, the Middle East in, in general, we have high um, levels of radiation, solar capacity still hasn't been capped fully. Um, and, uh, you know, there is still capacity for wind. I think it's slowed down a little bit in countries like Egypt, where, you know, we talk about these mega projects of, you know, aquifer investing and master investing. Um, but it's not really going as well as, as as could be, even though they get a lot of institutional um, financing. But um, the other thing is that you have the, you know, you have the potential and you also don't have the kind of red tape and bureaucracy that I think even Tobias in Germany, uh, I've, I heard a podcast once where they said, if you want to move components of a wind, um, you know, for, for a wind farm, it takes thousands of, of bits of paper and the, 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 the permitting process in, in the EU is so slow, it can take years. So it's all very well to set these targets, but you also have to have the policies to drive 
the, the process forward, which we're not really seeing. But we don't have that problem in in the Gulf states because you don't have sort of opposition from communities. Um, people were asking me the other day, you know, what about uh, the unconventional gas drilling? There's going to be a lot of drilling uh, in this really huge unconventional Jafura basin in, in Saudi Arabia. And I said, well, first of all, it's very far from, you know, from populated areas. And that's something that I think Saudi Arabia has in abundance, you know, a lot of huge open spaces where they can. Um, and um, so, and there won't be any, even if it was, there wouldn't be any opposition, you know, the sort of not in my backyard type, type of attitude. So I think that is an advantage for these countries. But as all the speakers have said, it's going to be very, very difficult. And I think at this particular time, um, in you know where the region is in flux, and now this the, the sort of the geopolitical risk is now higher than it was before, uh, even a few weeks ago. I think it's very difficult to see how you can actually rock the boats um, without causing social discontent. Not so much in the Gulf states, but in other countries. You know, Egypt is one country that the UAE is supporting financially. Qatar has. Saudi Arabia has, but you know, now not so much as just pouring cash into the central bank, but making it conditional. But it's one country that you just cannot afford to let um, to let fail because it's just too important for various reasons. And now they are on the border of this big conflict in Gaza. So I think it's it might slow things down a little bit, or at least uh, you know there will be a bit more caution in in how they go forward with their transition and with their diversification plans. Thank you. Um, I uh, just can also jump in. I mean, a lot has been said, but um, just my two cents here on the geopolitical issues and the energy transition, especially when talking about the global energy transition and what Jim has already outlined, that um, it will have certain implications. Uh, and I think that we can see it from a global energy market perspective that there will be major shifts and it might turn and develop into a more regionalization of energy markets here. So whether that we have not seen in the oil and gas sector or in the last century. So it will actually be more regionally. And especially what Kate has said, I mean, we are talking about a region that is in turmoil. There are a lot of things are going on. It's very difficult to predict anything because so many things are happening right now which we haven't really anticipated before. So um, it, it will be difficult, but, uh, um, and it might also change a little bit the, the, the centers of gravity in the region. I mean, we have seen that the Gulf states have been, have cried some gravitational force here within the region. With the energy transition, maybe we will also see that power will shift a little bit to other actors, so, such as Morocco, maybe also Jordan, um, but it all depends on a lot of different variables, such as whether they will be able to have uh, electrification to turn into energy hubs, whether there will be actually endowments of minerals, especially in Morocco uh, or in, and in Jordan, who are searching for, for a lot of these kinds of min minerals. We will also, a lot of uh, those things will actually depend on whether we will be able to foster and boost the hydrogen economy. And then there will be another question whether we will, whether this kind of hydrogen will be exported. Um, this will then be by shipment, which has other difficulties and barriers than only to transport it via a pipeline. Um, but, but certainly, I mean, still the Gulf states are well equipped for this kind of transformation so far, and they have the capacities, the financial capacities. They are uh, getting a lot of cutting edge technology in being also in the forefront of this uh, development. So um, making a short, a long story short, I mean, when we are talking about geopolitics of the energy system here, and when we are talking about the region, I don't see that the petrostates will actually be kind of on the loser side, but it will actually be still um, more like the winners here in, in addition to other countries, uh, Morocco, as mentioned, Jordan, but also Israel, who has a great potential for, for clean technology systems. We will actually see the kind of losers in this geopolitical game in terms of countries such who are which are already now in turmoil, like 
Yemen, um, Syria, maybe Iraq. So they are whole, they are really fragile. And so what I'm actually a little bit worried about is the fact that we will have this kind of geopolitical division between um, well-equipped countries that can actually benefit from this kind of energy transition. And this will might include the Gulf states, or at least a lot of those Gulf states. We haven't talked about Kuwait and Bahrain, who are maybe in a difficult situation or more difficult situation. But we will also see then kind of winners here, but we will certainly see also a lot of countries who will fall back behind and even more than before. And um, this this is something that we should, we should uh, keep an eye on when talking about geopolitics in terms of energy transition here. Thank you. Um, we have a new question by an anonymous attendee, um, which is a question we address, but maybe not so directly as it is asked here. Um, how do the decisions to host COP29 in Azerbaijan and COP30 in Brazil, both major fossil fuel exporters, reflect the ongoing debate surrounding the involvement of big oil in climate talks? Are these hosting decisions conducive to fostering genuine progress towards climate action? Or is there a risk, um, the, the risk for the entrenching fossil fuel interests in the negotiation process? Um, I guess, uh, Aisha, do you want to take a stab at this question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yes, uh, I think uh, we should move over like the uh, topic that uh, oil producers might, you know, delay climate action. Uh, well, um, I think what we have seen in the recent years through the engagement of the oil producers in climate negotiations, um, we have seen a, a shift from a denial of the climate change science to at least uh, the acknowledgement that uh, greenhouse gas emissions needs to be cut to tackle climate change. Now, even though oil producers are trying to figure out ways in which they try to protect the oil and gas community as much as possible, but at the same time, they uh, also try to be engaged in uh, developing the solutions that cut greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, whether uh, around the oil and gas sector or, uh, you know, developing the alternatives. So, for example, the Gulf countries, um, uh, you know, um, even though the UAE hosted COP28, uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, both announced uh, uh, an increase uh, in the oil and gas production, uh, Qatar as well. Uh, but at the same time, we see that uh, these countries also uh, try to uh, develop the, the solutions that uh, cut greenhouse gas emissions, including the carbon capture and storage. Um, uh, uh, also, the uh, there are ambitious plans around the hydrogen um, and also um, the investments in the electric vehicles, uh, the renewables, uh, and so on. Um, also speaking about the uh, the strategies uh, that the Gulf, you know, deploy uh, uh, when it comes to the energy transition, uh, yes, I, I can see that it is pretty much revolved around the protection of the hydrocarbon sector, uh, including, for example, uh, investments in the petrochemical sectors outside uh, uh, the Gulf countries, including, for example, in Asia, uh, because the Gulf countries want to protect uh, a market uh, for their uh, hydrocarbon uh, exports. Uh, we see that's happening uh, in, you know, building, building refineries, for example, in China. Uh, but also we see at the same time, uh, the two sides are signing agreements and memorandum of understanding to develop, uh, for example, carbon capture and storage uh, agreements around uh, hydrogen uh, as well. Uh, so for me, the way I see it, um, I, I mean, in the past, I, I would meet people from the oil industry and they say we are ex excluded from the table of the discussion 
uh, when it comes to climate negotiations. But now I think to have them uh, on the same table, I think it's a, a positive step because uh, uh, this is uh, this kind of approach to speak with them, but not about them uh, is uh, a positive approach uh, because it's gonna create the incentives uh, for the oil industry to be involved. And I think it is happening, but it is, yes, it is very slowly. And I, as I mentioned, because of the very complex trade off that these countries face. Um, uh, yes, uh, they have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to invest in clean energy, and that is costly. But at the same time, also the hydrocarbon resources help these countries to, to tackle the impacts of the climate change, especially in the Gulf. Uh, so for example, the electricity production, the cooling, the desalination, uh, depends uh, on the hydrocarbon sector. Uh, so in a way, it is not an easy way to just put it on the ground and just move on. Uh, it needs to happen uh, in stages, um, but at least uh, the way I see it, I think uh, at least uh, the oil industry is involved and it started to take an action a bit very slowly. Thank you so much. Can I just add something? Yes. Just yes, one, one very, very quick um, number. Um, demand this year is expected to be, oil demand alone is expected to go up to a record of 104.5 million barrels a day. Explain to me how that is going to be phased out by or peak by 2030. I mean, it just one has to be realistic and i think that's one of that's something that's been missing you know you've got this sort of very polarized discussion well it's not even a, a discussion between the people who say hang on a second guys yes we're all very well you know we need more energy but less emissions fewer emissions you know we have to reduce emissions it's not so much the 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 the, the energy that's that's the issue you need to supply more energy to the global south etc but 104.5 million barrel a day demand growth in 2024 and that's sort of both OPEC and, and they're not too far apart. They're sort of far apart on the demand growth number, but the IEA keeps um, between OPEC and the IEA, the IEA keeps uh, increasing, sort of up, revising up its demand forecast. So I think, you know, you have to look at the numbers and say, you know, one has to be real. You have to be real. You're not going to phase it out that quickly. You just have to find other solutions. And it's no point talking about carbon capture and storage if you can't develop it at scale. And at the moment, it's not even in, in in this part of the world, um, Saudi Arabia has one, one project. So, you know, all that has to be scaled up. You've got new infrastructure that has to be, you know, uh, brought in. Uh, somebody mentioned um, desalination. Um, you know, you have to, some countries are switching to reverse osmosis. I think the UAE is doing it. Saudi Arabia is considering it. Um, and I think, Jim, you mentioned, um, you mentioned uh, geothermal. Saudi Arabia is talking geothermal. In fact, they said when they were explaining why they were not going to go ahead with that increase in production capacity, um, they said, we are now transitioning. You know, we are transitioning into an energy company. So we're going to be doing all of it. We're going to be doing oil and gas and renewables and eventually geothermal. So it is happening, but I think it's unrealistic to say you can exclude the companies that are actually producing this 104 million barrels a day. Thank you, um, Kate. Uh, we have two new questions um, and we only have 15 minutes to go. So I think I'm going to read both of them and then you can each respond to whichever question um, you prefer responding to. Um, it, uh, from Mark Finley, it seems like many of you feel like it will be very difficult for the Gulf states to compete successfully in the energy transition, given how prominently countries like Saudi and the UAE are selling their transformation efforts to their populations. What happens if those efforts are disappointing or disappointed? Um, and then from uh, Gabriel Avgerinos, um, should the Gulf countries maximize their revenues from oil, gas, and petrochemical products by speeding up solar and wind electricity domestically in their own countries by reducing their own oil and gas use and reducing the CO2 and methane emissions. I could take a stab at it if, uh, if that's all right. I mean, Mark uh, Finley's my colleague, so he can get, uh, we, you know, we can talk up, but um, uh, 
you know, we can we can chat about this stuff anytime. But um, I, you know, I think it's a great question for the audience as well. Um, you know, so first of all, I think you know the 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 Gulf can compete well in the energy transition. I don't think that you know the fact that and I think Tobias did did uh, talked about this, right? So actually, they have a lot of attributes that will help them uh, in the energy transition. My argument is just that they just aren't going to make as much money, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, through those efforts that they, they get now. I mean, you know, in Saudi Arabia, you can produce oil. They're, they're lifting costs plus capital investment costs are somewhere around 10 bucks and they sell it for, you know, 80 or 90. Right. So it's, um, uh, you know, that's just uh, you, they're not going to be able to replicate that. But, um, you know, they can still um, compete really well in the energy transition. They've got, you know, Kate talked about lots of vacant land that gets great sun. It's right outside their their cities where the load is. Uh, they've got clustered emissions that can be captured uh, and put pumped right underground. There's great st the storage right 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 where those emissions are happening, and the clusters make it make it easier. The investment smaller, so um, you know lots of you know lots of good reasons that they can compete really well, um, you know, including autocratic governance, right, which helps them uh, uh, make long term policy and investment decisions that take forever in uh, you know in a democratic setting. So, um, but. Um, you know they uh, they they still um, uh, you know climate action is um, uh, it's almost like they can use it as a um, as as political cover a domestic political cover for other reforms that they want to do anyway right so I mean I, I've, I've written quite a lot about this but um, uh, you know economic reforms you know subs you know technocrats in the Gulf have been pulling their hair out about really uh, uh really high energy subsidies subsidies on fossil fuels uh for example that's made these that part of the world you know the most energy intensive uh, place on earth right and the most carbon intensive uh, economies on earth right so um uh you know it's a um uh, it's a great way to 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 achieve other goals that they want to do anyway that that, that make economic sense so you know whether it's um, you know, charging, uh, you know, rational prices for energy products and services, moving oil out of the power sector, right, in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, still burning even crude oil uh, to make electricity, uh, which is hugely uh, uneconomic, um, you, know, re you know, reducing the fuel consumption uh, and, and using that to increase exports and getting the full value out of that or, you know, turn turning that uh, those oil products into a higher value of uh, you know, goods, too. Um, and then, yeah, re reducing emissions also happens when you do these things, uh, you know, or at least you push it out onto somebody else's account, uh, national account and get it out of yours. So, but I think, you know, framing it as a as a climate uh, climate action that, that that the country needs to do to participate in this, you know, this global uh, effort to reduce uh, emissions allows the ruler the rulers, you know, you know, these are these are all sort of you know one man shows these countries. It allows them to deflect pressure. Uh, you know, onto outsiders, they, you know, they can say, look, we have to do this because we are under pressure from the world uh, is asking us to do this. So sorry, guys, I'm going to have to ask all of you to pitch in uh, and, and help us with this this global project. So it really helps them achieve other, otherwise unrelated economic goals, but that, that they can reframe uh, as climate policy. Right. So that's what uh, that's how it might might take that one. Thank you. Maybe um, again to to add a little bit on the domestic front because I also see it a very interesting point here and uh, thanks for the question. I mean, so um, I also would agree that that um, it will not actually be a disappointment or um, it will not lead to a critical juncture if they are not uh, promising on, on what they will deliver. Maybe they will be able to deliver, maybe not. I mean, again, predictions are hard to make. In this uh, in this time where a lot of things are happening which uh, cannot be anticipated, and we are talking here about long term um, long term goals, but I think that actually what have been said here and the self given goals are um, I mean they are planned, they are rational. So I think that there are actually there is a lot of um, um, they are serious about it. There are a lot of commitments to achieve this kind of uh, goal. So, so I would actually be be more positive in in um, 
the way that that they will not completely fail maybe they will uh, not achieve everything but in general i think they will promise on on the deliveries um and this is actually so talking again from the domestic point of view i think that it is actually it, important that they will not fail here because what we can see when looking into the domestic dimension is that topics of climate change and energy transition has become more important for for peoples than it has been a decade ago so uh climate awareness is something that's getting moment uh, momentum in the gulf and uh so it might not be as crucial as other aspects, but um, it, it at least to to keep in mind that it is it has become a very important point um, for the public as well. Um, a few years ago, when when the Gulf states started to to trying to transform their economies, trying to to um, shift a little bit away from oil and gas, it was more like a economic reasoning. And now we can see that there is also a social element here because it has been become so important for for populations in the Gulf. So I would definitely see that the domestic front and the domestic arena is another layer and another trigger point why they are pressed to achieve these kind of goals. Thank you so much. So I guess we, we touched upon so many different topics. Uh, one thing that we did not really discuss is the physical dimension of climate change in the Gulf region. Um, and I think, Jim, you spoke uh, to this in your 2020 article, saying that they are in a very unique position in that they will suffer greatly from an increase in temperatures, way more than other oil exporting countries, obviously, because of where they are. And that is something that um, uh, that we may be downplaying, that they may be downplaying, that um, certainly when you look at the results from the Arab, the last Arab barometer, um, that were like one country, there were questions in one country, I don't remember which one in the Gulf, I suppose it was Kuwait. Um, well, like people were basically saying uh, climate change won't affect us. It's very bad, it, da, 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 but we won't be directly affected. And so that's... That's a dimension that is usually not really addressed, um, which um, which is a little puzzling because I think that it is it will be a very pressing issue um, for them. So we have uh, eight minutes left. I wanted to ask a last question to all the uh, panel members. Um, if you can briefly uh, tell me what you think the main takeaways from COP28 were and what we could or should expect from the Troika and the next two COPs in terms of climate action. Uh, Kate, do you want to go first? You oh, went really? at the beginning, <laughs> so you go first now. <laughs> but don't worry about the sort of the impacts of climate change. We feel it here. I mean, I live in Dubai now and the sun, the winters are getting shorter. You know, we've had a very, very short winter. It's starting to get warm again now. And, you know, obviously it affects salinity in the sea so it affects desalination i mean there's i think um at the energy institute we did this sort of barometer um where we asked people about you know where they saw the biggest risks where they saw and you know water scarcity is a big issue that was one of the things that came up a lot um you know the, the fact that some parts of it might some parts of these countries might become uninhabitable but looking ahead i mean i think cop 28 whichever way you look at it was successful because nobody really expected the outcome. Were there things that could have been tackled? I, I think it was too much to ask for everything to be resolved. You know, they did get the loss and damage fund um, done from day one. Uh, you did have the reference to fossil fuels, you know, uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels. OK, it was fuzzy, but it was in there. Um, I think, you know, there's an issue in that it was sort of all fossil fuels are lumped together. If you look at the demand projections for natural gas it's like you know 70 percent growth between now and 2050 so it's um it's a bit difficult it didn't it, it's you know not binding um depends we'll see that you know the ndcs the new ndcs and what they um what they contain but i think setting up the troika is really important because you need continuity i mean who remembers the last few cops do you remember what happened in 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 sharm el sheikh or you know before that uh, and and talk me about all this fuss about the fact that it was in oil producing country. I mean, there's a lot of oil producing countries in the world. I don't remember a fuss being made when Qatar hosted it, for example. You know, at the time, 
the biggest LNG exporter in the world. So I think, um, uh, again, as I said, there's, there is, and as Aisha mentioned, there is now sort of, a, and, and we've written about this in AGSIW, about the investments that we're seeing from the Gulf states, from the GCC states into uh, Central Asia, Azerbaijan. So there is a relationship there. Yes, they, you know, they're oil producers, but then so is Brazil. You know, it is the biggest right. producer in Latin America. So I think there is, uh, it, it's very hard to escape the fact that, you know, these are these are countries that are going to be involved. They're going to host the host. It's actually, a, it's a UN party. And I just saw something today. The UNF triple C is actually running out of cash. They're having to cancel some events. You know, so it is really about money, and that's where you've got to resolve it. You know, you've got to find the funds to make sure that you have this sort of the troik, the, the the trilemma of affordability, access, um, and you know, let's not forget you've got the global south where their consumption of of energy and their emissions are so low um, that you're not going to be able to deprive them. So I think that's that's you know. I'm going to have to build it on. Yeah. yeah, because of time. Aisha, do you want to have like one minute to answer? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so the major concerns uh, when an oil and fossil fuel producing country hosts the COP, most of the focus goes on to the mitigation of the greenhouse gas emissions. But as you mentioned, Eleanor, uh, there's an issue of adapting to the impacts of the climate change, which are here, and everyone is feeling it. Uh, through the negotiations in the COP, uh, mostly the adaptation agenda get delayed, and not much of the progress uh, is made on the adaptation. Last year in COP28, uh, the adaptation fund has not been agreed on, and also uh, the, the, the negotiation committee is trying to uh, come up with adaptation uh, a fra a framework and targets uh, where every country can you know, set a target and quantify their adaptation measures. This still hasn't been accomplished, but uh, I hope this is also should uh, gain a lot of focus uh, this year, uh, not only on the mitigation side. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tobias. And then um, you, last word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that we will see this kind of continuity that um, uh, we will have more talks about mitigation. We will see uh, maybe more detailed plan about what's going on and how to to deal with Article 6 uh, and Article 6.4, which hasn't been finalized. Uh, so we will see actually more developments um, with regard to carbon markets, carbon development, and uh, offsetting carbon emissions. So all these kinds of uh, things that haven't been really clarified so far. And I think that the hosts will actually push the negotiations in this kind of direction. Um, it leads me again also back to my initial thought and also a little bit onto what Aisha has said that uh, we will see that um, it, it, it aligns with this kind of debate about perceiving climate change as a pure pollution problem that is based on carbon emissions while we are losing a little bit sight on other issues that are important mostly also Aisha has mentioned it adaptation um, justice, uh, climate justice, environmental justice here, protecting vulnerable people. So I really also hope that there will be more development on climate financing and not really only and purely on mitigation, but more on adaptation. Why, right now we see a huge gap between climate financing and mitigation, which is substantial, but uh, then we see very little on, on adaptation. And I really hope that we will overcome this kind of gap. Thank you. Jim, the last word, uh, briefly, if you can. Sure, yeah. I mean, I always look at the language that comes out of the COPS as sort of a important for diplomacy, but hasn't yet really translated into action. You know, it's, I see it sort of as a signal about acceptability of fossil fuels and for the, you know, more impetus to diversify oil, oil dependent economies. I don't expect governments that make these pledges that are, are going to stick relentlessly to to uh, you know to their goals that they pledge. You know, very few petrostates. You know, that in, in the research that I've been doing, 
actually do, uh, uh, you know, sometimes they completely ignore their goals. Uh, you know, you see them, you know, not even achieving 10% of what they've pledged, uh, you know, maybe back in 2007, 2008, 2009. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, demand, uh, demand signals are going to be uh, 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 probably needed and, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a way to place to concentrate, you know, and these are going to have to be, you know, demand signals need to be imposed through policy by governments or through by the private sector. So, um, so I, I guess slightly pessimistic note, maybe half and half, but uh, I'll leave it there. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you all for participating. This was a fascinating discussion.